All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. As, as Susan said, uh, my name is Jeff Sumler. I have a very um, broad um, background in, in animal science. Um, I, uh, I saw some folks um, putting up where they were from, and I've been in every state in the union except Nevada, and I got my bachelor's degree at West Virginia University. So shout out to Kim and anybody else from the Mountain State. Um, I, uh, I have raised beef cattle most of my life. I've raised sheep for a short period of time. Uh, when you're my age, a short period of time is less than 10 years. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, as Susan mentioned, I've been working with Susan for, I, I don't know, at least a third of my career with sheep and goats. And uh, at the research station in Washington County, Maryland, we did a lot of work with uh, lambs, feeding lambs and, and goats, kids and different things. So um, well, we've I've enjoyed that and we're going to continue on. So let's see how this goes. Maybe not. I always love it when the things are. There we go. All right. So just a quick review. There's the primary nutrients in feeding animals, um, protein, energy, vitamins and minerals, water, uh, one of the overlooked um, things that we should really make sure that animals always have um, fresh, clean water. Um, I'd like to tell people, if you wouldn't drink out of it, why should your animals? Um, I try to keep my stock tanks and everything else as clean as possible. Um, and fiber, and the reason I say fiber, especially since we're gonna get into lambs and kids a little bit later in the talk, is that these you are still feeding ruminants. And uh, probably a little more when it gets to show folks, um, but uh, they tend to want to get uh, really live on the razor's edge when it comes to feeding fiber. And uh, I, I, you just have to remember that these animals are ruminants. They have a, a four compartment uh, stomach, um, the rumen being the largest in the first one. And, you know, when, when it comes down to it, we're not feeding the, the animal, we're feeding the bugs, the microorganisms, the protozoa and everything else that's in the, the rumen. And uh, fiber is a very important part of that. Um, so I just want to emphasize that. Um, so a couple other things, um, you hear the word energy and then you hear the word TDN, especially if someone has a um, forage analysis or feed analysis and, and total digestible nutrients, excuse me, to, total digestible nutrients is a measure of energy and it is a calculation. Um, understand that it is a calculation. It is not true energy, but it's the best we can do given the tools that we have. So guidelines on feeding um, uh, on your flock. Um, because individual feed requirements change, we want to remember that animals have different production cycles and they have different um, needs during those production cycles. There are times when we can short them a little bit. There's times that we should never short them. And then there's some times that we're just gonna kind of balance things. We're gonna discuss feeding systems. And again, um, your systems can vary. And my hope is that you're going to choose the most efficient and economical system for your operation. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you what to do. I'll get, certainly give you advice. I mean, that's part of my job as a, an extension agent, um, but I'm not gonna, I never like to tell people what to do. I like to find out where they are and get them to where they want to be. The other thing I want you to remember, especially with when feeding livestock is flexibility. Um, you know, we can, we can make some changes um, in, in feed choices and forage choices. Um, but the most, one of the most important things, and you'll hear me say this again um, as we go through, is when you make those adjustments that you make them gradually. Uh, you, wanna, you never wanna make a feeding change like um, overnight or very abruptly because you're gonna upset that delicate balance in the um, digestive system. And in some cases that can be a train wreck. Um, from the perspective of when I say train wreck, I mean dead animals. So again, uh, you really need to um, remember that as you're making a feed change that you really wanna make things um, very gradually. Um, 
So when you're drawing up your, when, when I was drawing up this talk, I made a few assumptions, okay? So you need to understand that. Um, I make the assumption that your animals will always have access to loose trace mineral salt formulated for the species. So if they're sheep, it's formulated for sheep. If they're goats, it's formulated to goats. Okay, that's an assumption. If it's not you, um, you need to make it you. Um, and I say loose trace mineral salt only because I can't ever think about minerals without hearing Dr. Horvath in the back of my head saying the only thing an animal gets from a salt block is a strong tongue. Um, so they can't get it. They can't lick that thing enough um, to get the, the minerals that they need out of that uh, block. So remember, um, it should be loose trace mineral salt. It should be in a uh, covered um, feeder so that you can keep um, weather out of it. And uh, the other assumption I make is they'll always have access to plenty of clean, fresh water. Um, and again, uh, I can't overstate that enough. Um, and lastly, as I said before, you're always going to change feeds gradually. So we're not going to have anybody after, the, you know, six months after this talk, send me an email and say X, Y, Z. And what it turns out to be is they went from 100% forage to, one, you know, to 95% grain uh, in less than 36 hours and they got dead sheep. So again, we talked about production cycles a little bit. Um, <clears throat> we're going to look at all these factors as we go through our talk this evening. We're going to talk about age a little bit. We're going to talk about weight, stage of production. That's very important, especially if you're running a, a U operation or a doe operation. Um, those females have a lot of different um, uh, production cycle things that we need to look at. Um, sex, um, again, males versus females. And in species, there are some a lot of things, and you're going to see, I apologize to all the goat folks out there, you're going to see a ton of sheep pictures in my slide presentation. Um, and mainly because I've done a lot of work with both, but I'm a little biased towards lambs because I raised them personally. The other thing is that in most cases, um, we're going to feed the animals the same. There are going to be differences, and I am going to bring those up. But quite frankly, um, when we're talking about a kid or a, or a lamb, there's a lot of a lot of similarities. When we're talking about a pregnant doe and a pregnant ewe, there's a lot of similarities. So again, as we go through, make note of the, any questions that you might have. But if I don't cover it for a doe or for a ewe, and you can ask those questions when we get. Uh, towards the end. So guidelines, um, again, uh, we can have a pasture system, um, we can have a dry lot system, and we can have a hybrid system. Um, there's no one way to skin a cat, uh, in this case, um, raise um, small ruminants. Uh, I know folks that have had very um, good um, pasture systems, and I know folks that have um, very good dry lot systems, and I know folks that run hybrid systems. Um, I, I, I mentioned that I was at West Virginia University, and one of the things that happened while I was there was they built a, a barn specifically to raise sheep on slats. And I thought, oh my heavens, they've taken all the advantage away from the sheep. Um, they're grazers, they can graze over rough ground um, but I will tell you that they did a great job with that barn. And again, they had lots of other systems as well, but uh, that was just one. Um, so here's some other assumptions I'm gonna make. Um, pasture refers to well-managed grazing systems containing both grasses, legumes, and I'll even use the word forb. Some people use the word weed. Um, but when we talk about pastures, um, grasses primarily in, in my country, and I saw somebody from Washington State and somebody from, I think, North Texas. And anyway, when I'm talking about grasses in my context, I'm talking about cool season perennial grasses. 
So orchard grass, bluegrass, fescue, meadow brome maybe, meadow fescue, a common smooth brome, those types of things. Most of the legumes I'm going to talk about are red, white, and clovers and um, alfalfa. So those are just some things to put it in the context for you, not knowing where you're uh, located. Um, I want to make sure we understand that. Um, if I talk about annuals, I'm probably talking about members of the sorghum family. Um, and, and of course, some other annual legumes that we used over the years were sun hemp. Um, we've used some uh, cow peas and um, uh, you know, crimson clover, some other things like that. Um, my feeling is that you should always rotate pastures at some degree. Um, and, and what land base you have will definitely um, dictate what that looks like for you. Um, does that mean you have 20 cells, grazing cells? Does that mean you have two? I don't know, um, but that will be something that you're gonna have to deal with based on your land base. And then again, with a good pasture system, um, sheep should be able to eat all of the fresh herb, uh, herbage they want every day. So again, there should be plenty of forage out there. If you're just using a pasture system, I'm not talking about a hybrid system here. I'm talking about a system where you're looking for that animal to gain the majority. And when I say majority, I'm talking about vast majority of their nutrients from pasture. And that means you're not supplementing other than with um, the minerals and salt and, and that kind of trace minerals. Um, a good pasture should be limed periodically based on your fer uh, soil test and fertilized uh, every year, again, based depending on your soil test. Um, this is a quote from Penn State, and I can tell you that um, I can't say that I'm 100% against it. Um, maybe my percentage wouldn't be that high, but um, their, their take was over 90% of all sheep pastures don't qualify as good pastures. Um, I don't think. I'm not here to judge you on that, but I do want to emphasize the last thing. Be honest with yourself. If you are don't have great pasture, if you have basically uh, an exercise lot that happens to have some grass on it, or you know if you have um, you know not enough acres or something like that, just the only reason I say be honest with yourself, it'll just help you when it comes to supplementation. Do you need, and everybody, no matter how high the quality of their pasture may be, will almost always, at some point in their production career, have to supplement on pasture, whether it be because of a drought, whether it be because it's, it's too wet. Um, there may be a, a number of different reasons, but um, almost everyone comes to a point in their uh, production cycle where they're going to need to supplement uh, at some point. On, at some level, no matter how good your pasture is. So the amount of hay in each ration is the amount that you uh, will eat and not necessarily what you put in the feeder. And what I mean by that is you have to take into account that animals are going to waste feed. Um, in this particular case, the, the picture you're seeing there is the lambs. Um, I have another picture later on in uh, the presentation where the lambs are actually laying in the feeder. So you can imagine if they got up and defecated or urinated in that feeder, um, how much quality hay is in that feeder. Um, something else I want to um, point out is that um, alpha, when I refer to alfalfa hay, um, I'm talking about a crude protein content of above 17%. Um, what, what clovers are, are sometimes around 15%. We'll talk about red clover in particular as we get into the talk about um, use because of phytoestrogens and things like that. But basically that's what we're talking about when we're talking about legume hay. Most of the time I'll talk about alpha, alpha hay and not clover hay, primarily because in our part of the world with our humidity, um, it's tough for us to make good quality clover hay. Now, could we do we make a, a mixed hay? With clover in, absolutely, but a good quality clover hay is extremely difficult for us to make in most years. A mixed hay assumes a 50-50 grass legume mix, 
whether that's grass and clover or, or grass and clover or grass and alfalfa. Again, the crude protein content is going to be somewhere north of 13%, depending on the percentage of, of legume you have in there. And then a grass A, we're talking about a good grassy, a leafy grass A, somewhere about between 10 and 12% crude protein. Again, that will vary um, based on is it first cutting, is it second cutting? Was it made right? Um, that's another thing that you, I get more in, into the conflict with um, folks with uh, equine when I talk about quality hay than I do with um, other folks. But uh, a lot of times you'll, I have um, equine owners looking for um, Timothy hay and they want, it, they want to be able to see the seed heads. And in most cases, that hay is not good for much um, when it comes to sheep now, um, unless you want to give that to those, if you've got a bunch of ewes that you're weaning or something like that, that's uh, going to be a low quality hay. You're going to have to supplement that hay with other feedstuffs if you're looking to put it into a situation where you've got growing livestock or gestating livestock or something like that. So when I talk about corn, um, coarsely ground or cracked, um, again, I would, you, there are folks that uh, feed whole shell corn. Um, I'm not a big fan, but it, it can be done um, because someone out there will do it, get away with it and send me an email. Um, barley should be whole. Um, and then if I talk about a commercial feed, that's a complete feed. That's the one you bought in a bag from the feed mill or you want to tractor supply or farm and family or whoever you buy your feed from. Um, the percent uh, is the amount of crude protein in the feed. And we're, we'll talk about different um, protein levels based on different uses um, closer to the end of the presentation. Um, and all, all rations are the amount to be fed daily. So we, when I give you an example, and that's all they are. They're example rations. They are not gospel. Please don't write them down in ink and take them to your friends and say, you're not doing it right because you're not doing this. Um, there are lots of ways to feed animals and you can use a lot of different um, feedstuffs. Um, you know, Susan and I worked with um, goats for a number of years and we used uh, soy hulls in a pellet. Um, I can tell you that they're a good feed, but they can be expensive. Um, so. Again, I want to keep you in business, um, so I'm not going to say um, anything is, is uh, we want to make a low cost ration, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um, so <clears throat> when you're feeding a sheep or a goat, um, you need to meet the uh, maintenance requirements first. Uh, so anytime we're talking about um, animals, we're going to talk about maintenance and then above maintenance. So, uh, and we rarely do it when we're talking about young animals because we're always trying to grow them. But we're talking in a mature animal, um, the first thing we have to do is meet the maintenance requirements. And then we can uh, supplement to uh, grow fetuses or lambs or kids or to uh, milk for milk production or for flushing when we're um, talking about reproduction. Um, when it comes to uh, trying to get more lambs or kids. So again, we're going to meet the maintenance requirements first, usually about one and a half to two percent of the body weight in dry matter. Please understand that. So if you have a ewe that weighs 150 pounds, okay, um, I'm saying two percent of the of the weight of the animal in dry matter, not in as fed. Um, and that's a big deal and a big difference. Um, so unlimited, you know, basically free choice of pasture or two and a half to four pounds of grass hay will meet that. Uh, again, depending on the quality of your grass hay, your grass hay is not high in quality. You may need to add some grain, but typically for maintenance, if you've got a good quality hay or good quality pasture, you need no grain at all um, for the maintenance phase of the diet. Um, Body condition scoring, we're not, I, I, I had to keep this um, presentation somewhere under three hours. So we're not gonna talk much about body condition scoring other than I'm gonna refer to it. 
every now and then. And if you have questions about body condition and body condition scoring, um, you might you could certainly ask those in the the, the chat uh, at the end, um, or I mean in the question and answer time. But uh, it's it's going to be if you get confused, I apologize up front. But I, I, it's you know we could easily I could make a 45 minute presentation on body condition scoring and why we do it and what for and what should they be at certain production phases and when can we get away with a little bit less and so on and so forth. So um, we're, we're not going to talk about it too much, but it does um, when, when it comes to breeding and that's where we're at right now, we're getting ready. If you think about our production cycle, we've gone from maintenance and we've gone into our U flock or our doe flock and we're starting pre-breeding season. Okay. Now, in some parts of the United States, that might be August. In some parts, it might be um, later than that. It might be some folks might not. Some folks are breeding year round, so it could be um, different times of the year. Um, if you're in the southern hemisphere, it's probably again depending on the, the how strict to the photo period your use cycle and dose cycle. It could be um, a different time. But again, we're talking basically two to four weeks, um, you know, uh, around the breeding season. So, and what we're trying to do here is we're trying to elevate the, um, the intake of the U quality wise or in dough so that they're gonna give you more um, ovulations. And when we have more ovulations, we have more um, lambs or kids. And we really should be shooting for um, and this is going to sound um, bold, I guess, but I think you really should be shooting for a 200% lamb crop um, and maybe a little higher. Uh, you're, you may not achieve it, but uh, you, ne you never should set your goals low enough to achieve them. Um, you should set your goals to a point where they're achievable. But again, within your management um, skill set and within your feed resources, uh, again, I referred back, I'll refer back many times to my time in West Virginia, but at that time they were doing some work with Finnish, Finn sheep and I, um, and they have litters, literally, um, we had so many bottle lambs that, um, I raised, I can't even tell you how many, um, I, to the point that I said the biggest threat, the second biggest threat to the sheep industry in the United States after the coyote was the fin sheep. Um, there was just, and again, it's very labor intensive. It's a lot of extra work and cost and everything else. So again, um, if your system can't handle a, um, you know, litters of triplets and, and such, um, then adjust accordingly. Um, but we're trying, again, we're trying to uh, improve the body condition of the females and they, as they gain weight, um, again, it's a fine line because um, obese ewes and does don't do well and thin does and ewes don't do well. Um, again, we're trying to increase the, the ovulation rate. Um, later in the breeding, breeding season, um, the flushing may help improve embryonic survival. Um, ewes and does are in good condition, a, a body condition score of three or greater. Uh, usually don't respond as well to um, flushing. Doesn't mean they don't respond at all, but they may not um, respond as well. Um, and so you have to keep that in mind. So if you're doing a really good job on body condition scoring, your use will probably cycle very well, or your does will probably cycle very well without flushing. Um, so during this time, um, we're going to give them free access to pasture. Um, or two and a half, two and a half to four pounds of, of grain or grass hay. Plus, we're going to give them a pound to a, a, a half a pound to a pound of corn and barley uh, per day, and uh, we're going to move them to um, the highest quality pasture we have on the place. So, if you've got them on pasture, if, I'm not talking about a, a dry lot system, but if you've got them on pasture, you want to put them in the highest quality um, pasture. That you have. Now, a few caveats there when we talk about the legumes. First off, we don't want red clover in that pasture because of phytoestrogens. 
and we can mess up the reproductive cycle of the ewes with the phytoestrogens and red clover. The other thing that we need to be careful of when we have a, a high legume pasture, even if it's not um, red clover, is we have um, a lot of urea in the system and the urea can also mess up our reproductive cycle because we got a, a lot more protein than the animal needs and the way the animal gets rid of that is through urea. Uh, so you're making, uh, in addition to making expensive urine, um, you also could be upsetting the, the metabolic balance of the, of the animal. So once we've got the um, animal bred, so the ewe or the doe has been exposed um, to a, a male, um, they, they're now pregnant. Um, we're gonna look at early to mid gestation. Um, the goal here is to maintain body condition. We don't wanna get these animals fat. Um, and that's a very important thing that, that we try to guard against is getting these animals fat. Um, we may want to increase the condition in younger females. Again, if you've got um, one of the overarching things that you'll hear me say is, this, is the third bullet here, um, young females separated from mature females. Again, they don't tend to be as aggressive feeders. So again, if you're, if you're putting hay out or if you're putting grain out, uh, the older ewes, the boss ewes will push the younger ewes away. And it will, again, um, be something that you want to, pay attention to. The other thing that I recommend is you should probably have your um, animals scanned so you know you can feed. Again, in smaller operations, I hear you folks out there 20 years and you're saying, how am I going to have all these different groups? I get that. Um, so I'm going to talk to the, I'm going to give you the gold standard and then you can take it from there. And that doesn't mean if you don't meet the gold standard at your subpar, it just means you're doing the best job you can. Um, but, it, you know, if you can split off the, the you know, the singles uh, from the triplets and quads and so on, um, you're going to be better off because you're going to feed the animal uh, to its best potential. You'll get, if you're, if you're feeding them all the same, you're either going to underfeed that you that's carrying triplets or you're going to overfeed that you that's carrying a single. Again, free access to pasture. Um, we're two and a half to four pounds of grass hay. At this point in time, grain feeding is not necessary unless your hay is bad or poor quality. Or again, if you're in a dry lot system where you're feeding grain and hay together. Um, or the, if your females are under conditioned. Uh, if they're still under conditioned by early to mid gestation, um, you're behind the curve. You needed to take care of that up in the flushing period. But again, uh, there's always times when things get away and there's always going to be individuals um, that may be under condition where the rest of the flock, she may be the oldest you you have, she may have been you that were a doe that, that um, took ill at some point in time, you may have to baby that one a little bit, but um, again, by and large, your animal should be all in the same uh, body condition. So the last six weeks, this is the period where you really need to be careful. Um, it's a critical period for the ewe or the doe. Um, it's also the time when the um, fetus grows. The last thing you want to do is um, build, a, a, you know, put a lot of weight on fetus in the fetus, and also put fat in the in the ewe. And now you've got big lambs trying to get out a fat ewe, and that can be a recipe for disaster. Uh, mammary tissue is also developing here, and that's another time where. <coughs> We're, we'll talk a little bit about it when we talk about replacement animals, but we want to watch um, fat deposition in the mammary tissue. So we'll talk about that when we're talking about young um, animals. Um, proper nutrition is uh, necessary for preventing pregnancy toxemia um, and milk fever. Uh, sometimes you hear it uh, called ketosis. Um, in my world, we're out, again, I should. A caveat there is I work a lot with cattle. Um, we talk about ketosis and milk fever a lot, especially in the dairy industry um, that we're, I'm in the, the largest dairy county in the state of Maryland, which I realize there's bigger herds in the state of Washington than we have in our whole county. But um, at the same time, I work with these farmers and we talk about these metabolic diseases a lot uh, because we don't 
want to have to uh, treat them, we want to prevent them. Uh, nutrition affects the birth weight of the lambs. So we want these lambs to be um, healthy and vigorous when they're born. Uh, we don't want them to be too large that they can't get out, but we also don't want them to be so small um, that they have no vigor. Uh, so we, we, there's a, again, as it says there in the last statement, there's a higher mortality among small and large lambs and kids. Again, the large ones are probably because of dystocia and the smaller ones because they lack vigor. And we really want to guard against um, that. Again, dystocia just talked about, I mentioned, um, you know, difficult birthing, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, the dystocia is the fancy word for it, you know. And again, uh, we talk in cattle about calving ease or ease of calving. Uh, you know, when we had, when I ran uh, sheep, you know, and, and even now as I run cattle, I tell people, I want every morning to be like Christmas. I want to walk up and find new babies. I don't want to have to touch a, a lamb or a calf or a kid. Um, I want them to be born all by themselves and I want them to be up and nursing and I just want to celebrate with mom. Um, you should be aiming for a body condition score again in that three to three and a half range. Um, by the way, this is on a five point scale, not on a 10 point scale. Uh, in livestock, we have different scales for different species and sometimes people get confused. Uh, young females, again, they should be fed separately from mature females if you can do it. Um, I'm not, again, this is not gospel here, but I'm just trying to set you up for success. Again, these young females, imagine yourself a young female. Uh, you've just had a set of twins. You've never had a, a, a birth in your life. Um, you're stressed out from that. You got these two little guys always trying to nurse on you. You're trying to eat and the old user just pushing you around like you don't even exist. Um, at the same time, you're growing. Um, so you need to keep that in mind that these young females are still growing. They're still building frame. They're still building muscle. Um, and so they're going to need a different level of nutrition than, than your mature use. So again, suggestions. Again, these are, again, only suggestions. Um, you can feed five, four to five pounds of grass or mixed hay plus a half to a pound of grain. And again, when I'm saying grain, we're looking at um, in my, for my um, money, it's either going to be that corn or that barley because you want, you're, you're searching for the energy here um, and you're searching for a cheap um, ration. Can you buy bag feed, uh, sweet feed? Absolutely. Uh, or textured feed, whatever you want to call it. You absolutely can. Um, you need to match that protein with your grass hay or your mixed hay, uh, but you can. It's going to be expensive. Uh, I'm just going to tell you the way it is. And uh, so, you know, you want to you want to keep that in mind. Um, a pound and a half to a pound and three quarters of grain per day. Um, if if um, you got a 200% lamb crop, and again, uh, if you're expecting it to be 200% lamb crop, you get a pound of grain for each fetus the U.S. carrying. Um, a pound of 16% ration if forage quality is low for meat does. Again, you're going to have to have your forage tested if you want to know. Um, you know, it's better to test than guess. Um, I've seen people um, break open a bale of hay and they tell me how good it looks and all this stuff. And we do a forage test on it and they don't even want to talk about it. And then I have another person that has some bleached out hay that was maybe at the end of the barn or whatever. And we stick the probe in that and we send it away and it is uh, good quality. Uh, so again, it's better to test than guess, but we're looking for a good quality hay. And I, I, you'll have to go back a few slides, but remember in a grass hay, that's about 12%. Um, in an in a alfalfa grass mix, that's going to be about 15 or 16%. You should always include uh, Bovitec, Rumensin, or Decox in your feed or mineral to um, reduce coccidia uh, again um, and prevent abortions by tox toxoplasmosis. Um, again, this is going to be a time uh, late gestation and, and um, parturition 
are times of high stress for these ewes or does. This is times when their immune systems are gonna be pulled down and we can allow uh, other things to creep in. So we wanna make sure that we do our best um, and, and try to keep them healthy. So now we've got a, um, kids on the ground or they're coming um, or lambs are coming. Um, there's no reason to push the feed at, at these user does um, that have just given birth to their offspring. They've got a lot going on um, and you don't want to immediately ramp up that feed because again, what did that say about gradual feed changes? Um, on top of a, a abrupt feed change, you've got an animal that's gone from maintenance or late gestation plus maintenance and now full-blown lactation. And the worst thing you can do is hit the gas too hard. Um, that will cause you to spin out um, more than you would realize. Um, it is a good idea to um, bank some colostrum if you can. Uh, you, there are colostrum replacements or colostrum supplements. Um, certainly you can get those, uh, have them on hand, uh, but we wanna make sure uh, that we have plenty of colostrum for those multiple births, especially, you know, an older you that had has triplets might have plenty of colostrum. But if you've got a yearling that had triplets, maybe not. Um, and I would want to thaw out some of that colostrum or, or get some of the colostrum replacement. And I'd wanna make sure every one of those lambs got some colostrum. Just uh, the, the good start, you know, if you cheat the lamb, you're gonna cheat the ewe. So you gotta really, um, or I should say the ewe shall become. Again, too much um, feed early may increase the milk flow beyond what the babies can consume. Uh, I know I tell all my livestock producers, regardless, I tell them they're all dairy farmers. It just, um, the way they sell their milk is different. You know, the dairyman, the big silver truck comes in and takes the milk away from beef cattle farmers and, and sheep and goat producers. Um, their milk goes out in the form of a kid or a lamb or a calf. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a trailer. Uh, so again, we don't wanna get that milk flow. We don't wanna force it too soon because then we can have mastitis. And then if we have mastitis, we can lose a part of one of the, a part of the udder. udder. Um, we could lose the U. I I mean, there's all kinds of things we could go through. So again, we wanna always provide fresh water and clean water. And this, while it's always important and always critical, um, just imagine what percentage of milk is water, a high percentage, 85% or higher. So we really want to make sure that we get uh, plenty of water available for these does and use so they can produce uh, good quality and quantity of milk. Um, feed forage only, uh, feed forage is only for the very first few days after parturition, this will, um, again, we wanna make sure that gut's moving good. Uh, we wanna make sure everything's flowing right and um, that will be, and then it'll take about a week um, to 10 days to get that you or that dough on full feed uh, to, the, to push her up her lactation curve. Um, so early lactation is when using those have the highest nutritional requirements, as I said, um, ideally, if you could separate uh, females into production groups, singles, triplets, twins, so on and so forth. And again, um, always being mindful of the age of the, of the year or the doe. Um, in addition to producing milk, and remember, those young females are still growing. So that's why I oftentimes talk about them, um, maybe ad nauseum for some of you, but uh, we need to remember uh, that first year, she's still growing too. Um, so we can feed somewhere about four to seven pounds of, of hay. And again, these are, these are rules of thumb. Are you feeding um, Katahdin's? Are you feeding Columbia's? Um, are you feeding South Downs? You know, are you feeding Thin Sheep? I, I don't know. So you're going to have to look at, always go back to that thinking of it, percentage of body weight. 
Um, we're never going to feed a Katahdin like we would feed um, a Rambouillet. We're never going to feed a South Down like we're going to feed a ham. Uh, you're going to have to really know your breed, know uh, your size of your animals, and, and really take um, uh, that into account. Again, a pound of grain per lamb or kid that's being nursed. Um, because of the nutrient density of grain, we're going to limit our forage intake in uh, of those who use uh, nursing triplets. Not eliminate forage, but, but um, limit. So again, and again, if you're on really high quality pasture, you're going to really have to uh, you know, do a, a balancing act here because in every case that I can think of, there's in pasture, there's never a protein limitation. It's always energy. And when you have an energy limitation, that you or that dough is trying to milk. So it takes energy to milk. It takes energy for, for um, her to, uh, for maintenance. It takes, if she's a, a young animal, it takes energy for her to grow. And if she's got too much protein, it takes energy to metabolize that extra protein. So again, we have to really be careful uh, when, it, when we get into that uh, situation that Pasture is a wonderful thing, but we have to really be careful. And in some cases, if the pasture is high quality, we may want to feed a little more hay to slow the rate of passage down. But that's that's something you really need to talk over. Don't don't go home now, or don't go out to the barn and and uh, shut all the gates. Um, you really need to talk over with someone that's experienced in your area. Again. Um, High quality pasture should be good enough for using those that are nursing singles and twins. Uh, again, at weaning, um, a body condition score of two or two and a half is not uncommon. That you has milked down. Um, she has milked off. We're gonna have time between the time we wean and the time we're ready to breed her again to bring that body condition score back up uh, to three plus. Uh, so we're, we're not concerned about that. I mean, I'm concerned if it's below a two, but I'm not concerned um, even if it's a two. We, got, we have time to feed her. Now, I'm more concerned if it's a yearling um, that, that has a body condition score of two, uh, only because, again, we're trying to get her to grow. We don't want to short her, but um, by and large, that's where we're headed. In some cases, we may want to um, early wean. Uh, that may be because of uh, lack of pasture. If we're really relying on pasture, uh, we, we can, we, again, we can kick those dry ewes out on, on sub-quality pasture, put those lambs in the barn and feed them a high-quality hay and, and grain and, and not worry about it. Um, so we, we want to feed um, lower protein or energy feeds for five to seven days before weaning, and then we want, again, low protein energy feeds three to five days after weaning. And we're gonna wean cold turkey. Uh, don't <coughs> do any of these gradual things. Um, we wanna pull those, we wanna separate those lambs and those ewes. Uh, it's best, I know you may may pull at your heartstrings when you hear those lambs bleeding or those um, ewes calling for their young, but it's really the best uh, metabolically for those animals um, as well. And then. You look up there and you say about feeding low uh, protein. Uh, again, that will be the time that you want to get them off the good pasture. You want to get them onto a, a place that they're picking through uh, poor quality pasture, or even dare I say a sacrifice lot where you, maybe you're throwing in a little poor quality hay, uh, but you certainly don't want them on your best pasture at this particular time. Lambs, absolutely. Put them on that pasture. Use and does, no. Um, and again, growing these lambs and kids out, um, they have the highest protein requirements percentage-wise of any other um, fellow species because they are building bone and muscle. And so they have, the, these are the, if you want to think about it, the two highest demanding, uh, nutritionally speaking, portions of the production cycle 
is lactation and young, whether it be kids or, or lamb growth. Uh, you can creep feed these animals while they are nursing. Um, that's completely, an it should be completely an economic decision um, because it's not always economical to, uh, you know, depend on the price of grain right now, grain is fairly expensive. Um, so is it is it a good, you know, is your increase in gain going to offset your cost of grain? And that's only that's the only person that can answer that question is you. Um, are you able to get cheap grain? Are you able to get, um, you know, inexpensive um, feeds? That's something that you're going to have to answer. Um, energy needs to depend largely upon desired growth rates. Again, what's your endpoint? Um, are you going to try to uh, fatten lambs on pasture? Are you trying to hit an, an endpoint that's, um, you know, earlier? Uh, again, that will depend on those, the answers to those questions will tell you how hard you want to feed these animals. <laughs> and again, as with milk production, maximum growth is not always the most profitable goal. Um, and I try to tell my dairy farmers this, I talk, when I talk to livestock producers of any kind, you want optimum growth and profitable growth, not maximum growth. In most cases, and I can't think of one, where maximum milk production or maximum growth sustained is profitable. You may get the brag down at the coffee shop about how heavy your lambs were or how many pounds of milk your cow gave, but when you look at your um, checkbook, you're hoping somebody else is buying the coffee. And replacement females should not be fed for maximum gain because, again, I get back to that fat thing. Um, we don't want the fat deposited in the mammary tissue. We want that udder to have good um, lacteal cells in it. We don't want it to be full of fat. The fat deposition in the udder will reduce the milk potential um, of the future um, ewes or, or does you have. Um, <coughs> feeding these lambs, again, free access to high quality pasture um, and minerals might be all you need, depending on what your goals are. Um, you can, you should always supplement poor pet quality pasture, no matter what. Um, again, one and a half to two pounds of hay plus one to four pounds of grain. That's going to depend on what, where are, where is that animal in its cycle? Um, uh, you should, be, uh, as the animals are getting to the end of their, their um, production cycle, you might want to back the hay out a little bit. Again, I, I even hesitated to put this statement in because I know how some of um, the, uh, the, the show people really like to, to ride on the razor's edge when it comes to that fiber. Um, but, but again, those animals need some hay. They need some fiber. Uh, one of the reasons why I like barley over corn is barley um, is, is has is hulled most of it anyway, and that hull has a fiber in it. It's one of the one of the attractive things about soy hulls is the fiber. Um, but again, <coughs> those are going to be qu questions you're going to have to answer for yourself as you get into to feeding your animals. Again, pasture plus grain um, at one and a half one to one and a half percent of the body weight. Again, we recommend. Um, some sort of a coccidia prevention. Uh, we had a dose of coccidia go through a, our um, study this summer and it was not fun. Uh, so feeding kids, again, this is one time when it's gonna be a little bit different. Um, again, mainly because goats, kids fatten differently than sheep. Sheep fatten more like cattle on the outside to the inside. If you get a fat goat, there's probably a lot of internal fat. And again, that can be metabolic problems and so on and so forth. Um, you always want to um, supplement poor quality pasture. Um, you can see there in this picture, these, this was at our research farm. Um, those purple blossoms is vetch, uh, hairy vetch. Uh, that's a good high quality, high 
high protein um, annual that we put in a, that I put in a mix there. Um, free choice A, a pound, about a half a pound of, uh, plus a half pound of grain a day. Um, increase as the um, animals get larger and the forage quality gets poorer. Again, rumensin or decox uh, to prevent toxicity. Uh, weanlings or yearlings, about a pound of 16% grain um, if the forage quality is low. And, and again, I'm not telling you to take a bunch of forage samples, um, but I am telling you to look at your, look at your pastures. Um, are they vegetative? Are they old and stemmy? Um, are they grazed too short? Are there any legumes in there? Are there any forbs? When I talk about forbs, I'm talking about what your neighbor who has, you know, golf course lawn would call weed, dandelion, plantain, chicory, um, you know, burdock, uh, well, not so much burdock, um, curl, uh, yeah, curly dock, some of those things. Uh, these animals, goats in particular, like to browse, so they love things like mare's tail and sun hemp. These uh, plants that grow erect, uh, that can really have some really good um, forage quality. And we had, uh, um, I should have included it in my presentation, I'm sorry I didn't, but I took, when we were doing the goat test, I took forage samples of the um, quote unquote weeds mare's tail, lamb's quarter. And this stuff was great quality feed. And again, you have to understand the way the goats ate it. They didn't, you look at lamb's quarter sometimes and think, oh, that's terrible. They didn't eat that big old stem in the middle. They just took the leaves off and the, the, the tender shoots. And that was, that was high quality. Whenever I took pasture samples or forage samples uh, when we were doing the goat work, I always watched the, um, animals graze and then I test, I took um, a, my samples the way they graze. There was no utility in taking the entire plant uh, and sending it off to the forage lab when I knew for a fact that the animal wasn't going to eat it. Here's the guys that most people forget um, and yet they're half of, well, depending on how many rams you have or bucks you have, they're half of the genetics of your, of your flock, uh, but they oftentimes get overlooked. Um, they're put somewhere, they, you know, they're, they, they're kind of ignored. Um, but again, you, wanna, you want them to have a, a body condition score of three and, a, three and a half at the start of the breeding season. You don't, again, you don't want them to get fat. They get fat, they get lazy. Um, they don't move very well. Again, you want a very aggressive breeder. Uh, so you want to think about that. Free access to pasture or, or hay plus grain. Again, um, pasture and some hay. You can always, um, you know, modify your your um, feeding. You should you should start looking at increasing it a little bit prior to breeding season. Um, some males, some aggressive breeders will literally starve themselves during bre uh, breeding season. So you may have to supplement with those males with some grain. Uh, to keep their body condition score up. We want good um, swimmers. We want good potent semen. So we want to make sure that animal is in good uh, body condition score. So we talked a little bit about protein levels. Here's just some rules of thumb. Uh, you can look at this slide at your pleasure when, when the uh, recording is, is posted, but um, that's some of the what we talk about. And, and you'll notice that the youngest animal gets the highest protein, the oldest animal gets the lowest. So here's the million dollar question that I get asked a lot. How many, how many head can I put on an acre? Well, it depends. Where are you, where are you located? What kind of pasture do you have? What animals, you know, what are, are we talking about um, growing lambs? Are we talking about dry ewes? Uh, you know, it, in again, to make things equal, we talk about animal units. So an animal unit is 1,000 pounds of animal. And so you think, well, no sheep weighs 1,000 pounds. That's correct. So X, you know, whatever your sheep weighs divided by 1,000 gives you how many heads in an animal unit. Well, <laughs> from a perspective 
of places I've been in the United States, we have ranged from one animal unit to two acres to one animal unit to 62 acres. And I think I might have saw someone from New Mexico, probably out there, it's one animal unit per maybe even 100 acres. Uh, so again, it's sometimes there's a lot of steps between mouthfuls of forage when you're out um, in some of these parts of the of the United States. So be very careful um, with with using absolutes. Uh, I really don't like absolutes, especially when it comes to pasture, uh, because we can stock uh, warm season annuals harder. We can stock cool season annuals harder than we can stock, you know, warm season perennials or cool season perennials. So it really does. Um, it, there really is a lot of very variation. So regardless of your production, uh, in summary, regardless of your production system, remember your goal is proper nutrition at the lowest possible cost. All right. Now we're not going to, you know, be um, penny wise and pound foolish, uh, but at the same time, and that's a British joke, the pound is like a dollar, not like a pound of something. Um, so we want to make sure we're, we're, um, we're, we're prudent and responsible, but we're not going to, to um, short ourselves just to save uh, a dime. Uh, as I said, the photos are courtesy of Susan. Um, every one of them, I believe, maybe maybe one wasn't, but um, came where she was a photographer. Um, here's two excellent um, online resources. Uh, there's, there's, I'm sure, more. Um, I, like I said, I saw some folks from other states. I know Montana's got some good uh, ration balancing uh, information. Um, Langston's got a good one for goats. Uh, there's plenty of other resources out there. And if you go to that, uh, the sheepandgoat.com, Susan's got extensive resource links that you can certainly um, find a lot of those things um, on her page. So I highly recommend that. But uh, again, seek out as much as advice you can. Uh, the other thing I will say is if you're in a, an area where there are, are like-minded um, producers, ask them questions, talk to them. We have a, we have a group of grazing dairymen that we meet once a month. Um, and we, you know, as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. And they challenge each other's thinking. Um, they give each other advice. At the end of the day, everybody goes home, friends. And the person who hosted that day may not take any of the advice they received. They may take it all. It will just depend on um, that, but I think it's very, you know, we can, as human beings, we oftentimes can suffer in um, quiet desperation when we really should be seeking out folks that um, can come alongside of us. If they don't do anything but encourage you, how bad can that be? Um, so I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, as a, That's my contact information. 